You're listening to the Turn Autism Around podcast, episode number 205. Today we have a mom on the show, Caddy T, and she is from Canada, but originally from Ecuador. She is bilingual, Spanish and English, and um, she has a three-year-old son, three-and-a-half-year-old son, Santiago. She started my courses um, when Santiago was only 22 months of age. He's now three and a half, and he has gone from zero words and only a few babbles to um, pretty much uh, conversational to um a degree where he's answering and asking little questions going back and forth at three and a half. He has never been diagnosed with autism. He um, was diagnosed with a speech delay, but uh, Caddy just took it upon herself and did all the therapy herself and continues to work with him daily during most of his waking hours. In this interview, we talk about my brand new digital assessment that you can complete for 10 in 10 minutes for free still at freeautismassessment.com. And we talk about her wanting to raise her son in a bilingual household. And we talk a lot about how traditional speech therapy really focuses on carrier phrases instead of what we focus on within my online courses and community and spend a good chunk talking about the intraverbal subtest where we, um, where it really helps us identify a child's strengths and needs when they are talking in um, a few word utterances together. So it's a great interview. Hope you love it as much as I did. Here's Caddy T. So, Caddy, thank you so much for joining me today. I'm excited to get to know your story and you better. Thank you, Mary, for having me here. I am pretty excited today, but thank you so much. Yeah, we've never met before, but you have been very active in our online courses and community for a long time now. So I wanted to get you on. And I always start with the same question, describe your fall into the autism world. But I do want to say, and I know you'll say it, your son does not have a diagnosis of autism and was never even officially evaluated for autism. But so why are you here? Why did you take my course and describe, you know, what you were concerned about early on? Well, yeah, my son doesn't have, he's three years and a half right now. Uh, I don't have an official uh, diagnosis of autism, but at the age of 18 months, he was not saying any word. He was just saying, ah, and just pointing for a little, I mean, not too much either. And uh, for that a specific uh, visit at the pediatrician, she told me that she that he should have been saying at least mama or daddy. I speak Spanish, so he, he couldn't be saying any any word in Spanish too, but he was not saying anything. Uh, I also realized, I mean, when I took your uh, your online course, the toddler course, and studying all the information, I I realized that, for example, he was not uh, babble, his babbling was limited. He was just babbling with m, mm, ba, pa, and a. Ah, those were the only sounds that I could that I was able to hear at that time and just the pointing. And he was not responding like too much to his name too. He, sometimes we call him by, we call him by his name. And so sometimes he, he was looking some other times he was just like, he was not listening to us. Right. And, uh, yeah, that was the that, that, those were my concerns. So when I I I didn't find you on Facebook, it was my husband who who told me. So you know what? I found this on Facebook. So give it a try because I know that you're getting you're getting upset and you know that something is going on with 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 our child. So give it a try and let's see how it works, right? And you didn't you didn't start with my book or no, I didn't start with the book. Yes, I jumped into the toddler course and maybe when I it was last year by December, last year, December that I got the 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 book. So just about a year ago you got the course. Mm -hmm. Uh And um 
And I say this on some videos, but I don't know how much I say it on the podcast, but half of the members in the toddler course who introduce themselves don't have a child with autism. So did anybody, because you didn't have a diagnosis of autism um, and you still don't, does, was anybody like, oh, don't look into autism. You're just getting yourself all worked up over nothing. Uh, well, when I talked to the pediatrician and I brought the my idea that, I mean, that there are some signs of autism on him. And she, she said, no, don't worry. He, he doesn't have anything. But even though he was, uh, he, she referred me to a developmental pediatrician. So he was, uh, he was assessed twice, but <laughs> the, it was, it was kind of, I felt frustrated because when I went to the developmental pediatrician, the two times, it was less than five minutes that she said, this was assessment. Hey, look at this. And Santiago, look. But then she said, oh, what color is this? She was asking questions and Santiago couldn't answer anything because at, that, at the first time he was not saying anything. The second time he he was saying, uh, I mean, like approximation words, but it was just asking for colors, for numbers and things like that. And I was like, really? <laughs> so, but... Anyway, so that was the assessment. That so was the assessment. An assessment by a developmental pediatrician. I didn't know that. So, so, um, but she only spent a very short time with him. A very short time with him. That was it, the assessment, and I was like, "Oh my!" God. And the the last, the last, the last assessment, she told me, "You know what? In these during my whole career that I have like thirty years of experience here, I have seen that." kids uh speak two three and four languages at at home they if they are exposed to many languages they speak after three so i was like okay so then i was like because i have to be honest i i i don't work my husband is the only one pro the, the only one who provides economically at home so we were not in the i mean we couldn't afford uh an assessment that ex sometimes $3,000, $5,000. And we were like, we cannot do that. Even, even with a speech uh, therapist, it's $200 for each session. And we couldn't afford any, any of that. So I was like, okay, so I have to become the speech therapy and try all, all that I have learned with my son. Right. So, and yeah. Wow. Yeah, it is. It, it is quite expensive. Um, I know. And you're in Canada and you're originally from what, what country? Ecuador. I am from Ecuador. And so you're bilingual. And that's another thing we've covered in, in the podcast and a video blog is, you know, with a child with delays or with a, with a toddler showing si signs of autism, signs of speech delay, um, the, the thought is that, you know, multiple languages isn't going to quote unquote hurt anything. And, but in my experience, I have seen families like you and my recommendation is just like if you were teaching sign language, you don't want to teach it two different ways. Um, so I, my recommendation based on my own history of two decades working with kids, many of which were bilingual or even trilingual, is for the first 100 words, 500 words, you know, until they're they're starting to put things together. Okay. Um, I think it's best to start with one language. Not that you can't speak Spanish outside of table time or therapy time or pairing time. You can speak fluently in Spanish or English to other people. But when you're trying to get your son talking and trying to pair the early learner materials and try to pair the one word times three strategies, I think you should pick one language. And I think it should be the language where the child's early intervention professionals and school is going to speak and, you know, pick the language where he's going to have the most chance for generalization and exposure. So, so you did tell me that you did take that advice. And, yes. And I, I, I did what you said. <laughs> it, it, it could, it could be funny, but 
they I I just I stick to that like okay so I am gonna do this and I am gonna make it work okay I'm gonna make things happen right so when I heard that advice I said I as I told you I speak Spanish and I wanted him to speak Spanish too I didn't want him to lose that that language uh, but when I realized that he was not saying anything it was like okay so he's growing in an in in a country that English is spoken. He is going to 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 the school where English is spoken and English Spanish is not going to be spoken. So I said, okay, so I'm sorry, Spanish. You're going to be on a side for a little while. So and it was like that. I started speaking English all the time. My husband is a Canadian, so he doesn't speak Spanish. So it was just like we try all the time. English at home, English, English. When my parents came over, they don't speak English, they speak Spanish. So that was the moment that my son was exposed to that language. And uh, I didn't push him to get anything, any Spanish at all. It was just like, if one day he wants to say something in Spanish, that could be fine. And now he's just trying to mix not he doesn't have too many words in Spanish right now, but he he has some and he understands a lot of Spanish. So I think that 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 could be great for him. Yeah. And and Chino, who I talk about a fair amount and um, he same thing. His family wanted a, a bilingual household, Spanish, English. Um, they pared it down to just English in the beginning. But, you know, now he's. um older and he's bilingual. Um, and I think the same thing is going to happen for your son. Um, now that he is kind of over the hump of his speech delays, which he's made miraculous gains. And we're going to talk all about those gains. We're going to talk about his intraverbal subtest, but before we get to that, and I do want to note that in the show notes, this is episode 205. So in the show notes, we're going to have, you know, um, the the what what language for a bilingual family um we can link a podcast i did with magwai i think that's how you pronounce her first name she was in a similar situation um her son is now fully uh verbal in and bilingual um and also you said you had said with the you know getting diagnosed like Spending five minutes with a developmental pediatrician who just says, look, or what color, that's not an assessment for, well, that's not the kind of thorough assessment yeah. that mm -hmm. I would expect. But we do have a, a video blog on the M chat and I believe on the STAT or ADOS. We can link those in the show notes as well. So, um, but I think the real key that Caddy is talking about is it doesn't matter if it's autism. Or even, you know, we don't know, we don't have a crystal ball. We can't, I don't know what he actually looked like. And I can't diagnose autism anyway, even if I could look back, we don't know how kids are going to turn out. Yeah. Maybe it was the fact that you were speaking Spanish and English. Maybe it was, uh, maybe it was COVID isolation. Maybe it was, um, who knows, but it was something and we have a brand new digital assessment, which um, I announced with podcast number 198. Right now it is free. Uh, I don't know how long it will be free, but it is still free at freeautismassessment.com. We'll take you there. And just like my one page assessment, which is in page 49 of my Turn Autism Around book, this digital assessment should take you about 10 minutes to complete. Caddy completed it recently and got really great scores um, because her son is, I would say, if not all caught up in language, almost all caught up with language from, from this general one-page assessment. So she also um, kind of, just to compare where he was, she backdated a, a, uh, a one-page assessment with, on the digi digital app. And also just documented what he was like when she did join the course um, when he was 22 months of age, I believe. And um, 
he had no language back then and his scores in the language, this, this will give you scores in three areas, self-care and daily activities like eating, sleeping, potty training, grooming, dressing. He has had no problems in those areas, um, which is, is really great. So he scored uh, fine in the self-care area on both assessments, both when at 22 months and mm-hmm. again at three years, three months. Um, and then, but the language scores went from uh, 20, 20% to 85%. And again, this isn't like valid research. She backdated it just because she was coming on here. And I just, we're going to include these um, one page assessments with the scores, just so you can see these can you talk about the digital assessment and and how easy it was and yeah it was pretty pretty easy <laughs> it was pretty easy i mean uh to just it's just like very very specific the things that you the unique that you have to answer and that that give you an idea where you are and where do you want to go and which areas do you need to to work with, right? But yeah, yeah, it's pretty less. I I think that it was less than ten minutes for me to do it. Yeah, uh-huh. and it's not. Is it autism or not? It's just basically rating you. It's does your child do you have safety concerns? Do does your child have any sleeping issues? Does he have any eating issues? You know, and so you you wrote no to those. You check no. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And it calculates the score based on your answer. So I'm hoping this is the first version. It's still not great. Uh, his problem behavior score, even though he has very, very little very, behavior, uh-huh. is only an 80%. That's a little wonky. And other kids are having similar things where you put like, basically he has no problem behaviors uh, based on the fact that he's, you know, three years, three months or three and a half now. Um, and it's still scoring at 80%. So the higher the score, the better, but his overall score in those three areas is 88% now. Um, but, you know, we're going to fo- focus mostly on his speech delays because problem behaviors are not a concern and they're even better than ever. And, and- Actually, sorry to interrupt. Yeah, uh, actually, it has. Uh, he used to cry, but with I mean, developing language, it has. It is less crying, and it is. He has some time. I mean, I have right right now. Like he doesn't want to. Some kind of refusal. That I say, Santiago, let's wash your hands, and he said no. That's that's his immediate answer. No. So, but uh, then once again, watching the courses and watching the no more time, no more tantrums, right? Uh, that helped me a little bit like assessing again and try to remember when this is happening. And right now I find a strategy and he's not crying anymore. So I'm happy. <laughs> and he's happy. Yeah. 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 So, um, so we used to have a course called, well, it was called No yeah, More Time, no more time Out mini course. Um, and it's included as part of the full course, but it's also, um, you could buy just the mini course, but we just recently changed the name of it to turn tantrums around. And it's for small kids who are having tantrums and other problem behaviors. And it's really just preventative, proactive strategies. It only take you about an hour and a half to two hours to complete. And it, it apparently helped helped caddy with problem behaviors. So, so we went from babbling, not speaking at 22 months. 22 months. Um, you joined the course when he was how old? When he was 22. 22 months you joined the 22 course. 22 months. And then within the course, the toddler course is 60 days. So yeah. he, mm-hmm. he was having word approximations at that point? or When what? he, when I finished the toddler course, he was just like trying to make approximation things. Okay. Yeah. And I also taught him some sign language. Mm-hmm. So he was trying to, to sign, I mean, just 
because he was not like too much interested in our work. So he was just like interested in, I mean, when he was looking animals outside. So I taught him some sign language for some animals, some food. But yeah, he was trying, he was signing and he was saying approximation words. Yeah. And so then after the 60 days, people are like, well, what happens after 60 days? You know, well, just like anything else, a college course or playing the guitar, learning to swim, you go to the next course, you go to the next thing. Mm -hmm. And, um, and that is adding the verbal behavior bundle course, which, you know, the toddler course really gets you in good shape to learn that, that information. But that, that information is, is, you know, it was originally created for professionals and gung-ho parents. So um, it, how was that transition for you? It, it was good because as I told, I, I mean, I, I don't think that I mentioned it, but another thing that my, my son did is that his attention span was not good. He was just like going from one toy to another and he was running everywhere. So when I started the toilet course, I got the strategies to sit him at the table and that he he can be interested in what we were doing. I mean, it was just at the beginning, just reinforcements. Uh, he was sitting there. I, I remember that he liked at that time he liked to eat a lot. So I brought a blueberries and he was every time that he said something and that we did something, it was a blueberry, a blueberry. And he was happily sitting there. Uh and he learned to sit right there. And we started there with making sounds, making sounds, sounds, sounds. And when I jumped from the toddler to the early learning course or the BB bundle, uh, it was pretty much, we still do, we, we kept doing the same things, but obviously starting getting more, more skills at the, at the table, right? Like yeah. matching more and things like that. And, and we, I do have a video blog about table time and a whole podcast on the five questions. Uh, we frequently ask questions we get about table time, but table time is actually pretty controversial because most people think that with a very young child, two or three year old, you should follow the child's lead. And um, we, we, of course, uh, as my procedures, we never, we never force a child to sit at the table. We want it to be fun. We want the child running or eagerly walking to the table. And if that's not right, if you don't have the reinforcement and the demands right, that's not going to happen. And our table time is, is a mixture of natural environment, Iron landing man. and fun and some early learner activities that seem like fun, but they're part man. So, um, what do you think? What do you say to the naysayers about table time? Uh, what you mentioned about the follow the follow the child's lead, that was I was told to do that. I mean, in I, I got a private consultation with a pitch therapy, and she said, Oh, follow the lead, but th that didn't work for me. I mean, it was a complete disaster. <laughs> I'm not saying that it, it doesn't work, but <laughs> It was like, I'm not getting anything from this. So when I applied the strategy of the table time and reinforcement, and he was sitting happily there, as you said, he was not saying things, I mean, saying things immediately because uh, probably in my mind, it was like, okay, I'm going to try this. And he's going to, he's going to talk immediately. That, that is not going to happen. <laughs> that doesn't happen from, from night to day. It's just like, it's going to take a process, but I was I was seeing that I mean he was happy sitting at the table that he was looking at me like all the time like I grabbed the reinforcement I give it deliver the reinforcement and he was looking at me and he was looking at me like more like with an intention right so it was like oh cool. so this is this is great and then he was like trying to to man for things and trying to at least not say the complete word, but get something from his mouth. It was like, okay, this is working. So yeah, and as as I told you, I was trying to get the most of these strategies. So I, I think that follow the lead, it was just like not a waste of time, but it will it would have been taking a long, a long process for me to to help him and develop his language. Right. Yeah. And 
you know, we don't recommend table time all day long or every mm-hmm. day, obviously. We we only recommend short bursts of, you know, at the beginning, five, 10, 15 minutes yeah. and expanding it as the child really wants to. I mean, there we've been, uh, one of our success stories, um, Elisa with little Lexi, she's like, she had to lock the outside of the door because her daughter just kept wanting to go in to do table time. <laughs> you know, like these kids, it gets so well paired with your attention, with access to easy, fun activities that it becomes really, uh, really reinforcing. And of course, all day long at the grocery store, in the bathtub, you know, all of these strategies that you yeah, that, that, that the child are learning at the table, then we're expanding. Yeah, that helped me a lot because it was just not a table. I, I, I usually do it. At, I mean, when we woke up, I just like, okay, we're getting up and we do the table. And Santiago, I, I, up to this day, he said, Mama, table time. <laughs> so we go immediately to the table and we do a puzzle and we do a flashcard. And then during the day, I was like, I became like a, the narrator of the things, right? No. I was like saying things for him, even if he, sometimes he was not listening to me or looking at me. Right? But when he was looking, I was like, oh, these, these, and these. We went to the grocery store and I was saying things, even if he didn't say it at all. But if, if he was looking, I was saying things. So that helped a lot. When I was watching TV with him, that it was, I don't, I don't let him to watch the whole day. Maybe it's just 15 to 20 minutes. And I am not just like watching TV. I'm just like, oh, narrating. Oh, this, uh, this one is running or jumping out or ju- things like that. So my, my, my husband is a little bit upset at me because he said, let me watch TV. <laughs> <laughs> but at the same time it's just the way that I mean that he can listen and that maybe at one point he's gonna say it back to me uh, he's gonna use it at one time yeah mm-hmm. and um we we do recommend people say well how much therapy should kids have you know and it's like they need these strategies during all of or most of the hours which is a hundred hours a week at least um, and that sounds really overwhelming, but like you said, you just incorporate it in to your activities and you really just are keeping a child engaged. And, and, you know, at some point during the past year, um, and it wasn't one point, it was a gradual, he started, he was babbling, mm-hmm. then he was making word approximations and sign language, and then he had words and then he started combining words and he started playing more and started imitating more. And um, I would say from his latest digital assessment, which we're going to put in the show notes uh, with your permission, is he's he his language is pretty much turned around. Yeah, <laughs> um, I, I mean, I I think I I have friends. They have to. These two kids have the same age as he. They are a little bit more developed in his language. I think that when I hear those two and my and my and my son, it's just like oh, he's a little he's a little bit behind. So, yeah. But he's on the track. That's the most important thing. He's just like right. yeah, he's going on that way. And as you said, from bubbling, he was just saying approximation things, and then. It was like another thing, for example, that I was told with a speech therapy is like, okay, carry phrases and help uh, teach him to say, I want, I I need, uh, give me these. And then I was like, no, I'm going to follow what Mary says in the courses. So I just thought, I just teaching, I mean, nouns and verbs and adjectives at the table and out of the table. And after maybe when Santiago was like, 32, 32, 30, 32, he started combining words together. And okay. I was like, oh, so I didn't. At what point, so you did take him to a speech therapist for an evaluation. Yeah. And you said basically we're going to, or it was just actually therapy. You didn't actually get a and stuff like that, did you? I, I, I couldn't hear you. Did you get like, 
okay, his expressive language ability of a 26 month old and a, you didn't get, no, I didn't get that. I was looking okay. for that, but they, they told me that, uh, that, uh, part of the assessment was for the autism thing. Mm. So for the autism process, and they told me uh, we can do that. So the only thing that I knew that when Santiago was 22, uh, for the government center, they told me, oh, he's delayed, but they didn't tell me how delayed he was. So then he was assessed for the speech therapy, for that speech therapy, like two times. And they told me, so you know what? He's still delayed, but they didn't tell me how delayed. The yeah. last time I gave him, because she said, oh, because they were focused like on, oh, he's not saying like Lynn's utterances, like two or three words together. But that happened when Santiago was in the speech session. But at, here at home, he was just trying to join two or three words. And then I I made like a language sample and I brought it to her and it says, you know what? He's saying this at home. I don't mind what, it, I mean, I don't mind if he doesn't talk to you because obviously he's not going to talk to you. He's going to talk to me. So yeah. he's saying and, this. And we're, we find this a lot. Okay, so um, when kids then do have 50, 100, 500 single words, they have a bunch of words, right? And then we find that a lot of traditional speech therapists, like most speech therapists, and I've had a number of speech therapists uh, on the podcast, but those are all, they're mostly in the verbal behavior world, in the ABA world. Many of them, like Rose Griffin on podcast number 10, I think we can link in the show notes. She's both an SLP and a BCBA. She's taken all my courses and she is in our groups to support people. But um, traditional non-ABA SLPs almost always recommend carrier phrases. And what a carrier phrase for those of you listening are, are putting a pat phrase on the front um, of things. Like I want pretzel, um, I need, I see, um, or that's a, and this is a technique to get the length of utterance, the length of word utterance uh, to two or three or four, four words per sentence. And even back in the day when Lucas started to talk, I mean, that is what everybody recommended. Oh, and I even thought back then, because I wasn't a behavior analyst, um, that I was measuring his progress by his length of sentence, sentences, length of utterance. Um, I did do a podcast, which is actually, I don't talk about it much, but it, it is based on a lecture I heard Dr. Vincent Carbone, who's a BCBA D, um, he did a lecture on length of utterance and how it's so important. And it's podcast 94. We'll link it in the show notes. Um, and he basically presented a lot of research on the fact that we need to let our kids develop two word utterances on their own before we start monkeying around with anything with length of utterance. I did, you know, video blogs, we can link in the show notes, what's wrong with the goal of Timmy talking in three to four word utterances. And some of the work of Barb Ash, who created the uh, ECHOIC assessment as part of the BB map, she's an SLP BCBAD. And she, she basically said, it also, it should be word length like refrigerator is five syllables, one word, the cat ran down stairs or down the steps is, you know, we have to, we can't um, not count syllables. So in the beginning, when you're going from babbling to words, we need one word utterance, one syllable, syllable. one word, one syllable or two syllables like mama, which is easier than mom sometimes for kids to, to have that, you know, consonant in the end. And I'm not a speech therapist, but I will tell you, I have strong feelings about not using carrier phrases. We can link that uh, video blog in the show notes too, because I think what Caddy and her experience has done with these courses and basically just doing 
all the therapy yourself. You went to a speech therapist twice. She told you, if you bring them back, we're going to work on carrier phrases. Um, you said, no, thank you. And you did it yourself, which, you know, huge applause to you um, to, to just roll up your sleeves and continue uh, to get him as high as possible in terms of language. So let's, um, do you have anything to say about that until, uh, but then I want to move on to the intraverbal subtest. Uh, just, just to say that I agree with you. <laughs> like, I mean, yeah, we expect a child to, to speak immediately. And as I told you, it's just a long process. And right now within my experience is just let the child say, plenty, has plenty of words. So in with Santiago's experience, as I said, two words, he tried to join together and then he started by himself. Like, and I, I was like, sometimes I was like, I didn't teach you that. So how come you got it? So, and it was just following that strategy. I mean, let him learn and once he can do it, right? So, right. so yeah. once a child has one word utterances, then we teach adjectives, ad adverbs, verbs, you know, teach them separately colors mm -hmm. potentially, and then let them naturally put it together. I mean, you might have to do a couple little things, but it's tricky. And I say it all the time, like intermediate learners who are like, for those of you that know the BB map level two, level three, and intermediate learners are so tricky to program for, and they can become so rote and have such conditional discrimination errors that you or the speech therapist or the BCBA, well-meaning people mm -hmm. can make a real mess of language if you don't if you don't program very carefully and you don't let little kids develop natural exactly. language patterns. Um, okay, let's move on to um, I also in in with carrier phrases, we also don't want to do what I call tit for tat parent uh, programming. Um, programming too much for kids like Santiago because Santiago is is you know at this point typically developing I don't see from the videos that I've seen and the the you know the assessments any need for an evaluation for autism but we need to get his language to be as natural and as caught up as possible and also one strategy that helped me a lot was the book program. Yeah, okay. The book program was a totally good strategy for me to help him. Okay. So it was just like at a table, out of the table, and a good thing that he liked reading. So I was just like, okay, let's take advantage of that. And yeah. he also learned a lot from the from the books. So the book program, we have a bonus video inside the verbal behavior bundle. If you have a toddler or you're an early intervention professional, we always recommend starting with the toddler course, but then after 60 days, moving to the bun bundle. If you have an older child, starting with the bundle is good. Um, you can find information in our show notes about joining the course. If you're not sure if the course is right for you, attend a free workshop. We can link that in the show notes as well. But it's going to take a lot of, you know, um, time and dedication. People are like, oh, I can't afford it. Okay. You know, the money part is actually the easy part. The and easy I don't part. mean to be flip about it, but it is hours and hours and hours of your time. But you know what? You're parenting hours and hours and hours of your time anyway. You might as well do it easily and positively. And once you start seeing progress, it's amazing, right? Yes. Then it's yes. so motivating to yes. wake up and be like, all right, you know? Yeah. So my, my, as I told you, what we might have, and we have two different points of view. <laughs> so what I was, because I was a teacher in my home country. Okay. And uh, so obviously I, I usually work with kindergarten, but five years old and then I jumped to to become a professor so it was just like I, I feel sometimes frustrated like I, I could help kids in the kindergarten where I used to work and how can I not help my child right so and my husband was like Kari, take it slowly I mean 
take it easy, watch the t- watch the, the videos slowly. And I was like, no, I am in a hurry. <laughs> I mean, I, uh, this is like a marathon, okay? If I don't do it right now, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna do anything. So it takes time, but I think that when, as you said, once you see the, the results, it is everything worth, like, okay, go ahead. Go ahead and go ahead because I can get it. I can have so more results. Yeah. 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 Mm-hmm. Okay. So now we're going to jump to the VB map, um, the intraverbal assessment. It's a subtest of the VB map. And it is a great, great tool once you have a child who is putting some words together and beginning to do fill ins with song fill ins beginning to um, answer some very uh, easy questions in the beginning. Um, Now, for those of you that don't know, there are four elementary verbal operants. When when people say, does your child speak? And you say, yeah, they have have 10 words. So as a BCBA that specializes in verbal behavior, I'm going to ask you, well, how do they use those 10 words or 100 words? Can they request or mand? Can they label or tact? Can they echo you um, saying the word after you say it? And the fourth operant, verbal operant, is an interverbal. And that is the answer part of uh, asking a question. And it's the answer part. It is is always the most difficult verbal operant. It's the most advanced verbal operant. It doesn't start until 18 months of... um, uh, developmental level. So when, if your child is 18 months old and they're developing, typically they will start to do song fill-ins though they should, they will start to answer their name. They will start to, you sleep in, uh, and they'll start to fill in that. And, um, now we have, you know, older kids who can't do any intraverbals because they don't have the basic mans and the basic tax. And, and this all sounds complicated, but like Caddy, you can attest the toddler course. We don't really get into it. We just like shoebox program, <laughs> say cow, 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 cow. It's all in there. Mm-hmm. If they say cow, it's part man because they want the picture to put in the shoebox. It's part tack because they can see it. It's part echo because you're saying it. It's not part introverbal interverbals come later and we do song time which we talk about in the toddler course which is how to build those interverbals so the interverbal subtest is just a great tool it is the tool i would use if i were like if you are listening and you say i have an eight-year-old who's quote-unquote high functioning or has a lot of language uh talks in little phrases is in second grade where should I start? You know, um, as a behavior analyst, I would want to know where they're at in terms of intraverbals. And sometimes I, I would just go up to kids and I would just, just to see, I remember one time we were, I was in a classroom and it was like, um, oh, we just got Johnny. He's new in the class. And she, the teacher even said, oh, he's, he's really high functioning. I'm like, okay go up to him, start asking him questions to see, can he converse? Is he conversational? Um, So I go, Johnny, you know, or I said, hey, buddy, what's your name? Asking a a pretty simple question uh, on the interverbal subtest. And he said it. And then I said, you know, maybe asked him a couple more and he didn't really answer. And then I said, what flies in the sky? And he's like, three, two, one, blast off. You know, it, it just gives you an idea that, I mean, that wasn't a totally off the wall response, but it wasn't a response you would get from a typically developing or high functioning youngster. So the BB map assessment is eight groups. Um, we will post uh, Santiago's uh, results in the show notes, but his interverbal assessment is amazing um it was uh it was just done recently and did, had you done this um interverbal assessment earlier i did it when maybe last year by december yeah i did it i mean i got i think the first or the second like very well 
and then he fall apart in the certain and the third and this the fourth group and yeah. then i i think it was by march last month i mean yeah this march this past month march march or may that i did it again and he was doing much better and it was last week i think that i did that yeah. uh, i was totally impressed with <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. So the other thing, I don't, I'm not even sure if you know this caddy, but um, even typically developing four and five-year-olds sometimes make errors on group seven and eight. Yeah. So he, he actually scored a uh, great um, up until group seven and eight seven, and uh, seven, seven was, was almost most, it was majority so groups one of the intraverbal subtest is like twinkle, twinkle, little, uh, the wheels on the bus go, um, a dog says, so that'll be animal sounds, song fill-ins, happy birthday too. Um, so it's, it's those kind of things. Now, remember, this is everything on the intraverbal subtest is no visuals. So some of the techniques we use to teach this might be twinkle, twinkle, little, and we might hold up a star. But when we're testing, we're not using any visuals. Um, and then group two gets into like, what's your name? Um, you eat, you sit on, uh, you flush the, you sleep in. A, so they're, they're fill-ins, but not to songs. And then group three, what are some colors? What can you drink? What are some numbers? What's in a kitchen? Those tend to get, you know, it gets hard real quick. So it's very common. I know in the introverbal bonus video I have within my courses, um, I show face original one and she only had ready set, which was go. And that was the, her only response when she began. So it's really a great tool. We can uh, also post the blank BB map assessment or post a link to it. Um, that is all free of charge from Dr. Mark Sundberg, who created the, the, the introverbal subtest. Um, but I would say based on this with group seven at about 70%, um, and group eight being about, a five, um, five out of 10 from this scoring, um, for me, one of the, I wouldn't, I wouldn't even bother to do a BB map assessment at this point. I know you did one. Um, and you can, if you have one, you can program from it. Um, that's fine. All of our courses are based on, on the BB map. And even my digital assessment is something I created mm -hmm. way before the BB map assessment originally. Um, but it's all based on, um, looking at the big picture, looking at, you know, language, but also looking really a third of your time at those daily activities and um, self-care tasks, which normally are a big problem, especially for kids on the spectrum. Now Santiago is not on the spectrum. And then also looking a big chunk of the time at problem behaviors, which isn't a problem anymore for him. Um, but one, one of the things I would say is if you can get a standardized speech evaluation through your insurance or through government funding, um, I would do a standardized speech assessment now or as soon as possible. Um, and what, when's his birthday? In May, next, okay. next year. Okay, okay. So if just, so I would do it now or soon, or as soon as you can get um, somebody to do a standardized speech assessment. Um, if you, uh, if, if you said, oh, his birthday is December 8th instead of May, I would say, wait until after December 8th, because, you know, the language for a four-year-old obviously is different than the language for a three-year-old. Mm -hmm. Um, but since it's far away, I would do, uh, try to get a, a standardized assessment. And maybe you could go back to this government person or, another person from that agency and just say, I need a standardized speech and language assessment um, to see. For these high kids that have completed or nearly completed the BBMAP uh, intraverbal subtest, I then like to really keep my finger on the pulse of where his language is at. 
like the fact that you can compare them to your friends, two kids um, who are the same age is good. You're thinking he's a little delayed, but remember he only started talking a year yeah. ago mm-hmm. or, you know, nine and months. actually like 30, he's, he's 42. He started talking, like, I mean, like joining words and being a little bit more clear when he was 32, 33. Yeah. Just right so, before. So three. he's a new, you know, a newer talker than those kids that started at 18 months. So he just may need a little bit more time. Sometimes, you know, preemies have to get adjusted and those sorts of things. So, but I would say that most, most of my kids, if they can get, if they were at this point, one of my things was every six months or every year until he's caught up to get a standardized speech assessment, because they are going to be able to do the real hard stuff of the dogs following behind the cat because he's like, you know, like all of those intricate, um, speech things that, and, and he might need speech therapy at this point. Um, but they won't be working Well, they shouldn't be working on carrier phrases now, mm-hmm. but they should be working on those hard rule kind of more, um, more tricky kind of things that would be covered also in, in something like language for learning and language for thinking. But since he's so young, he's only three and a half, I might really focus on some, some good speech therapy. You could also look at like distance Um, speech therapy. Rose Griffin, I believe does some, or she could refer you to somebody even in the States um, that might be able to do assessments or treatment and not go against what you've been learning because you're right to be like questioning and not just going, okay, I did my part. Let's leave it to the professionals because you're still the captain of the ship, right? Yep. Mm-hmm. That's what I learned. <laughs> that, that's what I, I told Rachel too. So I I learned things to happen. <laughs> it's just not like waiting for somebody else to do it. I I mean, with no support, with no, I mean, with COVID too, it was like somebody has to do it. I'm his I'm his mom. And Nobody yeah. else is going to do it better than I can do it. So let's do it. The, as I told you, it was nights, long nights. I was crying. I have to be honest. I cry a lot. But I I finally see results and see progress and see that he that he's trying because also he's trying to learn and echo and uh using words, I mean, a daily basis, learning words a daily basis. So it's just like, okay, go ahead. Let's do it. Yeah. And uh, another thing I like about the introverbal subtest is he says, I don't know if he doesn't know something. <laughs> yeah. It's also a really great skill that, you know, most typically developing kids will use. Um, so, you know, I think it's, it's just great that you found my course. You weren't turned off by the autism. I mean, you know, in the title of the course. And, and you just were like, I was the same way. I'm like, even when I thought Lucas quote unquote, just had a speech delay, I was like, I got to go and find out what they're doing to help kids with autism because, you know, I want to, I want to know. And if that's the only place you're going to learn now, eventually, just like I, I created the mini course, turn tantrums around which people can buy right now for $47 and just dip their toe in the water. Um, I might create turn speech delays around, you know, because these are uh, behavioral techniques based on, you know, the literature, but based on my experiences as a mom, as an advocate, as a nurse and as a BCBA. And um, I think, there's just a lot of common sense tools that are working for kids with and without autism. Uh, another thing that, for example, with Santiago, I had is that the speech therapy told me, oh, he might have uh, like a uh, motor. Uh, Apraxia. Yeah, something like that. And I was like, OK, I, I, I was always trying to ask questions. right? So what can we do then? 
if you think that he might apraxia or dysarthria or whatever thing that you, how can I help his motor development, right? And they say, oh no, he's gonna learn. And I really, I felt frustrated every time that they told me he's gonna learn. So I was like, no, there must be some, there might be something I can do. So I remember that you mentioned talk tools once. So I went to that website and I found some good courses and that helped me a lot. I right now I, I feel like a speech therapy without a certificate. <laughs> Yeah. I mean, there's a lot you can learn and, and we do have a, a podcast on talk tools. We can link it in the show notes. We have also have a, a podcast with Tammy Casper, uh, who is, it's all about apraxia and autism. She's also one of those SLP BCBAs. And so there's so much that parents and pros can learn. And it's just, you know, just take some rolling up your sleeves and, I really appreciate you, you know, not only taking the course and sharing your success within our community, but also being willing to come on here and, you know, share your son's story, even though you're not in the autism world per se, um, you just want to help others uh, by showing. And, And I think that, I mean, one thing that I keep in mind was like, I don't mind if he has a condition or not. I mean, the only thing that I want is just to help him communicate. And even if he can say it in one or two words that he can communicate and be as clear as possible, right? So, and and I kept that in my mind always. I, as I told you, I cry, but at the same time, these gave me the tools to help myself and help my child. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And now he's he's on his way to being fully conversational. He is having little conversations. He's yeah. talking in in sentences. He is using contractions and and pronouns and and just, you know, some of the things you've typed in the community are like, wow, you know, to get from zero words to, you know, having little conversations in a year is amazing. So, yeah. So congratulations. So before I let you go, I always like to ask about uh, self-care skills or stress management tools that you use that can help you uh, be less stressed and lead a happier life. Um, One of the things that I do is walk with my child. We walk a lot. I mean, walk. We have walks. And uh, another thing that I do for myself is watching some TV at night <laughs> I know I know that it's I mean probably it's not the best thing but uh just well it's right. one of my one of my stress reduction tips too because I just was on episode 200 I got interviewed and at the end um, I, I I I right now I'm very attached not touched but I'm got into uh a program called it's a, uh, a series called stranger things um, and <laughs> and me and my me and my husband are like, okay, let's watch every night. <laughs> yeah. So going on walks and watching TV, I think uh, for the amount of time you spend helping Santiago do his best is is amazing. And so you get some, t- some downtime watching uh, some junk TV like I do. So. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much for coming today. I'm I'm also excited to learn that you're you speak Spanish and and you know as my books are both now available in Spanish, um, you know we can link those in the show notes and and I think I, you know some of the best people that work with me and and volunteer in my community and everything are past participants who have had success. So I'm excited to. Um, you know, have you along for the future and in the long term. So thank you so much, Caddy. Thank you so much for having me and for everything that you do, because I mean, this is so much. I mean, it was a blessing for me. It was a real blessing. Thank you so much.